Good morning. I want to welcome everybody this morning. I hope you all have had a wonderful week. And uh, so we're going to start off by reading some scripture this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 says, Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. So as we go throughout the week, we need to remember to comfort each other and lift each other up. So let's, let's open in prayer. Father, we come to you today. We're thankful for those that are watching online. We're thankful for those that are here. We're thankful for those that are unable to make it for one reason or the other. Lord, we just come to you and ask you right now that you will just help us to put all our concerns and worries aside and help us to focus on you. Lord, we, we want to worship you and we want to praise you for your goodness and who you are. Lord, right now, just help us to learn and give us what we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, if you're here, we'll ask that you stand and sing, Love Lifted Me.
Okay, where could I go? Page 470 if you're following along the book. again. Um, it's good to have you all here. Um, this morning we are going to be continue to be in 2 Corinthians and as we are in 2 Corinthians we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 14 through 17. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 14 through 17. Uh, before I get started, I'm going to ask Rex if he will stand and pray for the remaining part of the service. Thank you, please. <laughs> Mighty God, we bow before you at this time, Lord, we thank you that we're able to be in the house of God with freedom and with gospel. We thank you for the gift of life and health and joy and peace and love that you have for us. We thank you for Second Corinthians chapter two, verse 17 is one of my favorite verses. And it talks about old things being passed away and behold, all things have become new. And when we are Christians, we are to be different than the world. And I don't mean be nerdy or be odd necessarily, but I mean, just be different in the fact that we follow scripture. Ephesians chapter four, verses 11, or I'm sorry, verses 14 through 24 says this, and I don't have this up here on the PowerPoint, but it says this, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And this is again, talking about believers that we have to be different and we, we're not gonna be believe everything we hear, but we will be listening to the truth of the scripture which we've been talking about words matter and the word matters and we believe the word of god is truth it goes on in verse 16 from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body 
for the edifying of itself in love. And that's talking about as Christians, if we truly believe the word of God is true, then we will all be edified and we will come together. And as I was preaching yesterday or last Sunday, I had a gentleman walking out and he told me that he heard a statistic that out of evangelical pastors, only 43% believes that the word of God is completely true. So I want to make it perfectly clear that we here at Heritage believe the Bible is 100% true. We believe that it is from God and we believe it's not our opinions that matter. It's what matters is the word of God that matters. Ephesians 4, verse, Ephesians 4 starting with verse 17 goes on and says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of your mind having your understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings have given themselves over to lewdness, to all uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have, not, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed by the spirit of the mind and that you put on the new man which was crafted according to God and true righteousness and holiness. This morning we're talking about a new beginning. We're talking about what happens when you receive Jesus into your life. What happens or what should happen at that point. And our main point and main scripture, and we're going to be looking at others around that but 2 Corinthians 5 17 is one of my favorite verses because it says therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation old things have passed away your old man is no longer there behold all things have become new you be have to be born again and you become new to be made new we must realize our need for a savior Romans three twenty three says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, well, they're a good person. Well, that doesn't going to get them to hell. Or there's a lot of people that say different things about different items, and, but it tells us that everyone is in need of a Savior. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this isn't popular in today's world, and this isn't popular in today's society. So words matter, and the word matters. And I'm going to, the reason I asked Rex to preach, because I know it's going to be a very touchy subject today, and, and I, I just want to make sure that, this, that you realize that this is the word of God. This is not Ken Gray speaking, this is the word of God, and this will be some by some considered hate speech. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and then we'll come back to 2 Corinthians, but 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That sentence right there to some is considered hate speech. I want to stop right there because we just saw, again, if we believe the word of God, then we, we just saw that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means you, if you've never repented of your sins, that you're headed for hell. That means that if you have never said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, then you're headed for hell. That means that you need to get right with Jesus. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? There's people out there saying, you cannot tell me that I'm headed for hell. That's hate speech. There was a, there was a, a, a person that spoke at a graduation ceremony this past week, very close to us, but it was, in, it was on the Today Show, and it just came out yesterday, and because he told people that, told the kids that the women should marry men and the men that should marry women, According to the Bible, he was now being ridiculed for hate speech. It goes on, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters. Just to be clear what fornicators is, I think we all know what that is. That They're unrighteous. Idolaters, anything you put before God, unrighteous. Nor adulterers, that means if you cheated on your spouse, you're, you're unrighteous. Nor homosexuals. That means if you're a man sleeping with a man, you're unrighteous. That means if you're a woman sleeping with a woman, you're unrighteous. And that doesn't say that, hey, I'm a man, but I choose to be a woman. Or I'm a woman and choose to be a man. What it says, 
homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves. That means if you've stolen, you're unrighteous. Nor covetousness. That means if you see somebody else's big camper and you think, ooh, I want that, you're unrighteous. Nor drunkards. That means if you get drunk on occasion, you're unrighteous. Nor revilers, nor extortioners. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Told you. <laughs> That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But he goes on and talks to the church and he says, as such were some of you. Some of you sitting here in the pew today were, could fit in some of those categories. I'd like to think that you do not any longer. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. That means you're now set apart. You're different because what we just read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If you claim to be a Christian, you're going to be different. You're not going to be like the world. You're not going to fit in any of those criteria that we just read. But you're justified. Justified means that you, would, you live as just as if you'd never done these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You say, wow. Many of these things the world says is good. Many of the things you'll hear people say, well, I was born an idolater. I was born a fornicator. I was born a homosexual. You were right. You might have been. I'll, I won't even argue that fact. But we are told that we are all born sinners in need of a Savior. You hear me? So if you say you were born a sinner, you're right. I was too. But I had to ask Jesus into my heart and be born again. There are things in Scripture that says is sin, but the world says it's good. God says it is not. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 says this. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. If we call those things that I just read about or any other sin that the Bible talks about, if we call them good, if we say that is not sin, we are just as unrighteous as the rest of them. So how can we show God's truth to a lost and dying world, to people who... Most people, if you go out, they will say, oh, I'm a Christian. Because after all, America is a Christian world. And by the way, we think, well, we're just born a Christian. And it doesn't work that way. You are not born a Christian. You must acknowledge your sin. You must repent of your sins. You must say, Father, forgive me of my sins. You must realize that you have a need for a Savior. The unfortunate thing is that many of today's society does not recognize that they have a need for the Savior because, oh, I've got it all down pretty good. I'm a good person. I'm a nice person. But that same person can be very nice. They can say nice things, but they could still be a thief. That same person that says nice things could still be someone who is sleeping with someone outside of marriage, but they're a nice person, so they think they're going to heaven. The Bible says, no, you're unrighteous. But the good news is that you can be different, that you can ask Jesus into your heart, that you can be different. So this morning, let's look at what a new beginning looks like. Those of you that call yourself Christians, how are you supposed to be functioning in life? What are you supposed to be doing? What can we be doing about this? How can we start a new life, and once we've claimed to be a Christian, what is a new Christian supposed to do and act like? You must be controlled by love. I'm not talking about what the world calls love. I'm talking about what the Bible calls love. Verse 14 of 2 Corinthians says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. This gentleman who stood up in Marion, by the way, at a graduation and said, I want to encourage all you men or all you boys to go out and find a good Christian woman. And all you girls, I want to encourage you to go out and find a good Christian man. That was considered hate speech. That was not hate. That was love as long as, long as he delivered it correctly. And I want to say that to prove a point that sometimes, so many times, when we start talking about different sins one or the other, we tend to try to magnify one sin over the other, and we're disgusted by one sin or the other, and we don't show love. 
But as Christians, we are to be controlled by love. That means if somebody is a, a liar, then we got to treat them with love and tell them that they're lying. If somebody is, is a thief, we can need to treat them with love and tell them that they need to Jesus in their life. If someone is a homosexual, then they need to be know that they are loved and in spite of their sins and let them know that they need Jesus in their life. But the problem is too many of us go at them and say, how dare you, I'm disgusted by you. We need to say, you know the Bible says this, and let them see that they have a need for a savior. Being controlled by love sounds easy enough. I'm loving. But I know there's times I come across rude because I like to be funny. That's just, I, and, and that's probably my setback. I, I'll, for a laugh, I'll, I'll try to put somebody down or something. I try not to do that, but I'll, I'll, I'll be a smart aleck. I'm a natural born smart aleck. And I'm loving, but do I love everyone? The word for compel here in this verse, or control, depending on what version you have, is sinecho. It means describes pressure that produces action. So for the love of Christ puts us into action. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all did. Do you love everyone? Do you show love to everyone? Do you show that love to people? Do we show love to every single person, regardless if we agree with what they're doing, regardless if we believe their political status, regardless if we believe and agree with where they're living, regardless of we of joy that maybe they got a drug issue and we'd tend to look down on people that's got drug issues because how dare them, they have a sin that we don't have. How dare we, those guys, be looking down on things because we they struggle with a different sin than us. That you know there's people there in our society, there's sins that we think, oh, that's okay, we can live with that. We are to love as Christ loves. In Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight, verses thirty five through thirty nine says this Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake? We are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we were more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in the Christ Jesus our Lord. Now people that are sinning, people that are currently sinning, people that go to church and say, I know God loves me, they'll use these verses and say, God wouldn't send me to hell because of these verses. And that's very true. However, God's not sending you to hell. You choose to go to hell because you are choosing to continue to practice the sin that you were born into. We all have a choice whether you admit you have a choice or not. Some people will say, what I'm doing is my choice. But I, yeah, you have a choice, but we're told that that choice is unrighteous and we're in need of a savior. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even tribulation, not struggles, not problems, not anything. And when, when we show love and preach the word of God and show love, it's considered hate because it doesn't necessarily agree with my own opinion. And I've said it before, I've said it about all every, almost every Sunday this year, that if your opinion and the word of God does not line up, your opinion is wrong. The only thing we know that is truth is the word of God. Has someone caused you pain? Has someone caused you tribulation? Are you able to show love and forgive them? Has someone mistreated you? Are you able to love them? Has anyone caused you distress? Has someone stripped you of your life as you knew it? Those of you that's been married before and went through a divorce, can you say you love your ex? Ooh, now I'm meddling. Can you say that you love that person that mistreated you, that left you and just completely tore your heart out? Or maybe someone got you fired from a job and, and they tr mistreated you or someone lied about you and now your world is different. Do you love that person? Maybe someone's sinned against you. Maybe someone's messed your life up. Maybe that sin affected your life pretty big. 
Can you figure, can you forgive and love to those people? Can you show love to those people? It's easy to say, oh, I love them in the name of Christ just because God told me to. But can you show love to those people? Can you show compassion, godly compassion and grace to those people? Jesus died for all of us, and he died for them. Jesus didn't give you his life just for those perfect people that never do anything wrong. Jesus didn't die for each and every one of those. He died for each and every one of us. And all of us were unrighteous at one point or the or another. And we realized our need for a Savior. And some of us have recognized our need for a Savior and asked God to forgive us of those. And we became a new creation. God loves those who sin. But he also will offer punishment for those who are sinning. And people say, well, that's not love. Why do you punish a child? Because you want to see them do better. That is, we're told in Scripture that the reason you punish a child is because you love them. And God is the same way. When we are doing things that is wrong, that doing things that are wrong, we will have to face that, that punishment. Jesus loves those who sin. In a, is there a sinless person here today? If there's a sinless person here today, I want you to stand up. Not one. I realize none of us are perfect, but the difference is, and, and unfortunately, sometimes we try to come across to the world that we've got it all together. I can tell you, I don't have it all together. I struggle probably daily. I have to repent of my sins daily because I realize I need Jesus in my life because I'm not perfect. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. It will take much prayer, it will take much guidance, it will take much wisdom. But truly being controlled by love is possible. True love produces forgiveness. It's not about treating people differently. Can you, can you show love to anybody else? The issue is people believe the word of God isn't loving, but truth is love. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6. It's talking about love. I put love in parentheses because that word is not there in the verse. But it's, if you look at the whole idea of the scripture, in the, it's talking about love. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. You say, what is iniquity? And we can say, this is truth, that is truth. I'm going with what the word of God calls iniquity. I'm going with what the word of God calls unrighteous. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. Love does not rejoice in the unrighteous. Love does not rejoice in truth, or in untruth, but rejoices in the truth. Love rejoices in the truth, which is the Word of God. We Christians, if we say we're a Christian, then we must be controlled by love and we must be different. Secondly, don't live for ourselves. Verse 15 says this, And he, talking about Jesus, died for all. And those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. How many Christians live for themselves daily? And it's easy to say, well, I'm not perfect, and I just said that. And it's easy to do that, but we must strive to be Christ-like. We can never use that for an excuse to sin. Because we are supposed to be different than the world. Don't live for yourself, but for him who died for you. Here's a newsflash. The world don't revolve around you and your interests. It's all about Jesus. If we're Christians, we are here to serve Jesus. Colossians 3.23, And whatever you do, do it for heartily as to the Lord and not for man. That means if you work at a water company, you need to do it for Jesus. That means if you work for an electrician, you means you have to do it for Jesus. That means if, if you are a farmer, that means you're farming for Jesus. That means if you're retired, then as you spend your retirement doing it for Jesus. You don't just sit around, you go and you are making disciples as we're commanded to. He died so those who live should no longer live for themselves. That's pretty huge. Some of us may need to hear that again. He died so that those that live should no longer live for themselves. That means if you claim to be a Christian, you should not be living for yourself. You should be living for him. Many of us have a problem with to be controlled by love because we are too busy loving ourselves. 
We love ourselves. We love to talk about how awesome we are. We love to do all this. And we love to do things for the community. We love th This church is probably the best church in the community for doing things for the community. I'm a little biased, but I'm going to say that. But do we do it for Christ? Do we do it to represent Christ? Or do we do it because it's just the nice thing to do? Or do we do it with a reason? All that we do should be to glorify God. We should not be living for ourselves. To start out new, we be, need to be controlled by love and show love and don't live for ourselves. When someone sins against us or does something to us to wreak havoc in our lives, it's not always easy to be controlled by love at that point. It's not always easy to be controlled by love and not to live selfishly. People spit in Jesus' face. If you spit in my face, you're probably going to get a fist. That's not what the Bible says to do. The Bible actually tells us to turn the other cheek. But the people spit in Jesus' face. I would have been selfish. Is that an excuse for that? No. And I, I would like to think that if you hit me in the face that I would turn the other cheek. But I'm still growing. And, I, and again, I'm not saying that as an excuse to sin. I'm just saying I got some growing to do. How would you react if you come face to face with someone who did you wrong? It changed your life for the worse. It will take much prayer, much guidance and wisdom to truly be controlled by love. Remember this, remember this. Everyone you're in, every time you're in a teachable moment, there is a possibility of a change inside of you. What you are going through might be a teachable moment. That person that drives you crazy, that person that considers, the, that says they're unrighteous, you might be in a teachable moment. Right now, Jesus might have put you here to be in a teachable moment. Maybe you fit some of that criteria of being unrighteous. You have a need for a Savior. I hope you are recognizing that. So to really start off new, we must be controlled by love. We must not live for ourselves. Third, we keep the burden for sinners. We keep the burden for sinners. Verses 16 and 17. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Here's the thing. We need to remember that there are people dying and headed for hell that we walk by daily. Do you have a burden for them? Or do you just say, well, that's their own stupidity, dummies. That's living for self, that's not living for love, and that's not keeping a burden for the sinners. Are you so selfish and so controlled by, by the lack of love that you don't have a burden for those who are sinning around you? My question is, when's the last time you held another, someone that claims to be a believer accountable? We're supposed to hold Christians accountable. That's not judging. We're supposed to hold each other. We're supposed to edify one another. That means if you see a Christian, that someone that says they're a Christian, they're practicing homosexuality, show them scripture. If they say, I don't care, then they're probably not really a Christian. If you see someone that's a Christian and they are stealing, and you hold them accountable out of love, and they say, I don't care, they may not be a Christian. Because true Christians want to follow the word of God. True Christians believe the word of God. When we hold each other accountable, we better be ready to be held accountable as well. And I think that's probably where it comes into play because many of us don't want to be held accountable for our own sin. I remember right when I first started preaching and I was working construction and, and, I was, and we was going through that and I was working construction. As you know, on a construction uh, field, there's a lot of, lewdness if you will and there was a guy that told a dirty joke and it was hilarious i'll be honest it was funny i started laughing the guy looked at me and he said i thought you were a christian oh he said wait a minute aren't you even a preacher oh, yeah 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 but that was funny <laughs> but shame on me i'm supposed to be different that showed me right there that people are watching me, even though I thought the joke was funny. 
It's supposed to be different. And that right there burdened me because here I am supposed to be an example and I had a burden for this gentleman and he saw what kind of example I was living in. Sometimes Christians don't win souls because they really don't look any different after all. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3 says this. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My, on, my conscience also bearing me witness to the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself was accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Do you know what this is saying? He's saying, I have a great burden for the lost, and, and, and if I could do it, I would give my own life so that you could become a Christian. Do you have love like that? Do you have a burden like that for those that you love? That's huge. That's love. That's selfless. That's what Jesus did. He died so that we don't have to. When a brother or sister sins, how do we treat them? Most of the time, we become selfish about it. <laughs> At least I don't struggle with that one. The Bible tells us we should go up to him and say, Brother, it saddens me that what you're doing goes against the word of God. It saddens me that what you're doing is not setting a good example. And you claim to be a believer in Christ, but right now, according to Scripture, you're not living that way. Most of the time we go up to them, if we want to call out their sin, we'll, we'll hold up signs and say, this is what matters, or that's what matters, or, or, hey, how dare you, you're headed for hell. A sign that says homosexuals are going to hell is not out of love. I don't care if you're holding a Bible on a street corner and you're saying all sinner, all homosexuals are going to hell. That's hatred, and you're no better than the homosexual. Those people a lot of times are doing it because they want to look holy. Those people come across as hatred because it is nothing but hatred. Those people are the religious Pharisees because they're not showing love. Yes, we are told that homosexuality is sin, but you know what? In that same passage of scripture, we're told that hatefulness and lying and stealing and revilers and sleeping together outside of marriage with someone of the opposite gender. We're told that all that is sin too. We don't see picketers for that. We don't see hatred for that. It's because we're disgusted by certain sins and in our own humanity, we start calling out things that we think is more holy or not, but we are to love them. If we truly love that person, we would get to know those people and be able to go up to them and show them the love of Jesus Christ. But instead, we had much rather point fingers and say, how dare you and hold up signs. That's not love at all. And if you're doing that, you need to get yourself right with Jesus. We need to show love to the people that are dying and headed for hell. I've seen this in action. Some, peop some people that are sinning, they're, they're ignored. Uh, you ever seen this happen that when maybe a fellow believer sins and they, they, they don't feel right coming to church because they feel sin, they feel convicted. And so then the rest of the church tends to just ignore them because they don't really know how to respond to them. How about going up to them, put your arm around them and say, man, I love you. I'm going to walk through you, with you through this. What you did was wrong, and you need Jesus. But we can work through this together. How many more people would we see coming to Jesus if we showed them love instead of, how dare you? People are in the churches all over saying, hey, we, we have a world that's going to hell in a handbasket. But that's because we're saying, how dare you, how dare you, how dare you? Instead of saying, let me walk beside you and show you Jesus. Now, at the beginning of the sermon, there was a lot of amens, a lot of people saying, that's right, they're, they're unrighteous, they're unrighteous. But you know what? We're just as unrighteous as the people that was in the unrighteous list there if we show hatred to those who are living unrighteously. Think about when you've been caught in sin. How did you want to be treated? Think about when you've been caught in sin. Did people show you love? Or did people show you hate? More than likely, it was probably a little bit of both. I can tell you that 
God has never, we've never seen people come to Jesus through hatred. And that is misrepresenting Jesus Christ when we try to do it that way. When you've been caught in sin, when, when you sin, would you like to be kicked or ignored or, or maybe just yelled at or told how terrible a person you are? People talking about you behind your back. Would you like that? No. But how awesome would it be when you're caught in sin that you're comforted and show love and try understanding and someone come up to you and they're controlled by love and they're not living for themselves and they have a great burden for you and they tell you because they love you, you need to get this taken care of. So why is it that we many times respond that way? It's not about what someone deserves because each and every one of us here, and I will say each and every one of us here deserves hell. I don't care if you're a good moral person. I don't care if you do this or that, whatever. We all deserve hell. Some of us have recognized that and asked Christ to forgive us and have become a new creation, as it says in verse 17. But we still deserve hell, but because of the grace of Jesus Christ, we're not headed for hell. Verse 17 again, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Christians, are you new? Old things have passed away. Christians, are you sick and tired of your old life? Christians, do you no longer have your old life? Because once you become a believer, behold, all things become new. Are you living a life as a new person? You can say, I was born this way, I was born that way. I was born a liar, I was born a cheater, I was born... Uh, with hatred in my life. It's because of my upbringing that I have. I talked to someone this week. The reason I live such a terrible life is because of how I was raised. You know what? We all have a past. We all have these things, but at some point or another, we have a choice. At some point or another, we're going to have to make a choice if we're going to continue to live in the way that we was brought into this world, the way that we was born into it, or if we're going to become new. So how can you start out with a fresh perspective. How can you start out with having peace? How can you start out with having joy? You get rid of the old. You get rid of the old man. You get rid of the unrighteous person. You get rid of that sin in your life. And that includes not looking at someone else. That includes right now just looking at your own life and saying, what do I have in my life that is unrighteous? What am I doing right now? Am I showing hatred to these people? Or maybe I fit that list? Or maybe, do I live a life that the, the Bible would call sinful. Get rid of the old. Non-believers, give your heart to Jesus. Believers, get rid of the sin in your life and say, forgive me, I haven't been living like I'm supposed to be living. Be controlled by love. The only way you're going to do that is through Jesus Christ. Don't live for yourself, but show love to other people. Everything you do should be going towards Jesus. And keep a burden for sinners. If you don't have a burden for sinners, there's something wrong. And you need to pray and ask Jesus, Jesus, why do I not have a burden for those that are sinning? Because there's people that's dying and headed for hell. And we're just going on about life and just enjoying life because, hey, after all, we're good. It's not about what those you sin deserve. We all deserve help. But because of the grace of God, some of us said, okay, forgive me, Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says this, Do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the light hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's heart. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. We don't need to judge people because God's got it under control. Some of us may need to hear that. We're quick to judge sinners. How dare them behave as it just comes natural for them. But we also are not very quick to hold each other accountable. We'd rather talk about so-and-so doing what they did instead of going up and holding them accountable out of love. So Christians, if that's you, pray for the sinners. If you see someone, a brother or sister in Christ that's sinning, 
Go up and talk to him, but make sure you're doing it with the right heart. Don't do it. Go up to him and say, I'm better than you. Don't come across as I'm better than you. Go up beside them and walk with them through this problem so that they will come back to where they need to be. You see, words matter and the word matters. There's people out there that would possibly call this message hate speech. There's people that out there that would say that what you're saying is wrong. There's people out there that are saying, you can't tell me that I'm headed for hell. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says, and that's what I have to do because that's what God has called me to do. If you don't like what the Word of God says, I'm sorry for you. Because we believe here at Heritage that the Bible is the true Word of God. After all, it's one of our seven points. If you don't believe me, look back there on the back of the wall. I still love you if I don't agree with you. Some of you may need to hear that. I still love you if I don't agree with you. And I hope you can say the same thing about me. Some of you may automatically hate me because I say I believe everything in the Word of God. I can tell you, yes, I do believe everything in the Word of God, but I still love you even if I disagree with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the truth that we have some truth to be able to stand on. Lord, in a society where truth sometimes is muddy, I can believe one thing and someone else can believe another thing and we are supposed to say both of those are true. I'm thankful that you gave us the word of God that we can have something to stand on. I'm thankful that you gave us the word of God that we can stay, stand up and say, Lord, it's not my opinions, but it's what you believe and it's your truth. Lord, I don't always like what I read in your word either, but I know it's true. So Lord, I just pray right now. Anybody that's hearing me, anybody that's watching me, anybody that's here, show them their need for you. Lord, I believe we live in a society where in America, so many people don't really truly believe they need Jesus. So Lord, I pray, show us all our need for you. Because Lord, I know that it's going to have to happen that where we will not make a decision until we see that we truly do need you. And then Lord, as we repent of our sins and we try to live a new life and we try to live as a new creation. <laughs> Forgive us when we do stupid things. Thank you for your grace and your love that help us to not use that for an excuse to sin. Help us to just continue to walk as you walk. Help us to be examples of you. Help us as we walk to be able to show the love of you to other people. When we see someone sinning, Lord, help us to not take joy in that, but help it to burden us and help us to prayerfully go to that person and hold them accountable if they claim to be a Christian. And if that person does not claim a Christ, to be a Christian, help us to also go to them and say, Father, and just be able to walk along beside them and help them to see their need out of love. Lord, I know that this is a touchy subject and people, people don't like to necessarily hear these things. And so I tried my best to go along with what your word says, Lord. And I pray if there's anything I said that is not in accordance to your word that is wiped from everyone's memory. And Lord, just help us to be able to, all we do, do it in accordance to you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you that are here, I ask that you stand and sing, Lord, I'm coming home. <laughs>
this time we have prayer requests, but before we do that, we're going to do um, some praises. Um, first praise is we had our mortgage burning this Friday, and so we was able to pay that off. And I believe it was 2014 today was the first um, entry into the thing that um, Ray wrote that where we broke officially broke ground. And so 2014 on June 12th is when we did that. So it's ironic that it's so close to the date that Friday night we did the mortgage burning. So that's awesome. And thank you for all that had a part in that. Another praise was Bob Bash. His cancer is in remission. So we're thankful for that. Also, mom went Friday to her heart cath and there was no blockages. So thankful for that. Uh, we also have some uh, prayer requests. Continue to remember Rebecca Whitaker. We've been praying for her for a while. Just continue to remember her. Continue to remember Jeff Rickenbacker, um, Jet Wayne's nephew that's got liver melanoma. Uh, continue to remember my buddy Bill Imes, who's got bone, bone, sorry, bone cancer. Continue to remember Kelly Rickle. She will have surgery on Tuesday. She will not. Until July. July, okay. Um, so just continue to remember Kelly Rickle. Um, again, she does have breast cancer and just pray, continue to pray for her for encouragement. Continue to remember uh, Jenny, which is Katie's friend that's got breast cancer. She is taking chemo and continue to remember Katie's friend, Dan. Uh, last I heard he's in ICU, not doing well. So just continue to remember him. Also continue to remember Austin Douglas, um, trying a, a trial in Cleveland. Continue to remember Vic Osman, cancer in his jaw. Continue to remember Jenny Prine. Um, and just continue to remember Amy Knoll with, um, she's taking chemo pills. Continue to remember Steve Bowman with pancreatic cancer. Um, the chemo wasn't tolerated, he's not doing well. Continue to remember Penny Nickel with breast cancer. Continue to remember Ron Kennedy. Also continue to remember Jim Ogden, which is Karen's dad. She told us last week that he's got some skin cancer. Continue to remember Rick Pinnock, I hope I'm saying that right, with lung cancer. Uh, he had surgery on Friday to remove part of his lung if it hadn't spread too far. Um, an update on Jenny Hensel. Uh, I did talk to her Friday, Thursday, Monday this past week. Thursday, I think it was. And she was diagnosed with low-grade glioma. As of right now, all we know is it's a brain tumor. Surgery will be on July 13th to remove that. She said they will cut me about one to two inches past my hairline, fold skin forward, take out the front part of the skull, take out the tumor and put everything back. It will be a three hour surgery. Josh won't be able to be with her for about six hours. She'll be in the hospital for three days and a six week recovery. We'll send it off for testing and determine if, if or what kind of treatment is needed. I also talked to Tammy Conley this morning uh, during the Sunday school hour and she is going to be having surgery on July 22nd. She's got precancerous tissue on her right breast. And so once they do that surgery, they'll send it away uh, for results and for tests for that as well. So continue to remember them. Also continue to remember Tim Curtin. Remember Karen Curtin. Uh, continue to remember Melvin Donnell. Um, still ha having critical heart issues. Continue to remember Patty Heberling. Doing therapy, short of breath, wants to get back to work. work. Continue to remember Irene Strasbaugh. Uh, she is home on hospice. Continue to remain, remember the Ukraine-Russia situation. Before I forget, I'm gonna say this now because it's not anywhere written down. Mark your calendars for June 22nd. I'll have more information next Sunday, but June 22nd in Mount Blanchard. I believe it's gonna be at the Mount Blanchard Methodist Church. Um, there's going to be a minister from Ukraine coming to speak about everything that's going on. Um, it's kind of a last minute thing, but mark your calendars for June 22nd. Um, there, there's going to be a Ukraine pastor coming in and speaking for that. So again, I'll have more information about that next Sunday. Uh, continue to remember Jen Jenny Snyder. That's a classmate of Joy's. Um, continue to remember Pat Geisner, non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver. Continue to remember um, Bob McKee's friend, Bob Baxter with a brain disease. Continue to remember Charlie Kane. He had a stroke, still at the hospital, still can't walk. Still continue to remember Dorothy Benro. Uh, she fell, had some tests, um, and sh she's still doing rehab. 
Uh, continue to remember Faith Moyer, uh, 19 weeks pregnant right at this point and doing well. So I did hear from Doug this morning as well, and many people have been asking about his soldier shoulder. He says, I, had, I have my MRI in Lima tomorrow morning at 10, and on the 16th I have a nerve test supposedly to try to rule out carpal tunnel. That confused me. <laughs> I was like, I've never heard of carpal tunnel in the shoulder. He laughed at me, of course, because he said what it is that it could be carpal tunnel that's affecting his shoulder and everything. So, um, but that's what that test is all about. Uh, Jenny Hayes, continue to remember her. She's still in lots of pain. And then any, remember any of the unspoken requests that I've received, which I've actually received a lot of unspoken requests this past week. And then many, any of the requests that I have forgotten. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you once more. Again, we're thankful for you. We're thankful that you gave us your word. Lord, and in your word, we are told to let our requests be made known to God. And Lord, that's what we are doing right now. We bring all these requests to you and maybe some that I even forgot. Lord, I just pray right now that you bring healing to those that need healing. You bring comfort to those that need comfort and encouragement to those that need encouragement. For those that's got doctor's appointments and tests and things happening this week, we ask specifically for them that you will give them the strength and encouragement as they face these things. Lord, right now, help them to trust you. And Lord, I just pray if there's any of these people that do not know you as their personal Savior, that this will draw them closer to you and that they will repent of their sins and accept you into their life. Lord, I just pray right now that you just help us and help them. And if there's anything that we can do to help these people, that you will put it on our hearts to do these things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now with just a few uh, announcements. We, uh, we do have offering back in the back. If you are watching online and you'd like to give, you can do so through Venmo or PayPal, um, or you can just mail it to the church. We have our baby bottle campaign. Those of you that don't know, kids, that if you don't know, next Sunday is Father's Day. Just a heads up. And so all the baby bottles are supposed to be in by Father's Day. So if you have a baby bottle out that you put change and cash and stuff in, make sure you bring that back by next Sunday. Um, also, if you're looking for areas to minister, there's a list of possible ministries on the back of your bulletin. If you're willing to do some of those, talk to me. Also, there's a trustee sign-up list out in the foyer and things needing done. Also, tomorrow, tomorrow's going to be when we're starting our Run for God program. Um, that will be starting at 6.30. Tomorrow should be the longest Bible study portion of any of those. Most of the times, we'll try to keep it around a half an hour, but I'm hoping that we won't be much longer than that tomorrow. Just kind of tomorrow is going to be the first one to kind of explain what it's going to do, how we're going to do it, that sort of thing. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. But we, the goal is to kind of start on Mondays at 6.30 to do a little Bible study thing. And then once that's done, we'll go out and we'll start walking or running or, or jogging or whatever you guys want to do um, to be able to do that. Uh, there are a couple apps. If I don't know how many of you are wanting to, I know some of you are going to be doing smaller programs. Some of you are going to maybe walk around the, the property. Some of you are going to just different areas. But if any of you have a goal of running a 5K, I would encourage you to download the app Just Run, and that has a Couch to 5K program on it that will be able to tell you when to walk and when to run. And so if you plan to come and you plan to do, would like to train to be in a 5K somewhere at some point, Download the app, Just Run, and if you have questions on that, I can, I can help you with that as well. But I just thought that would be good to get that downloaded before tomorrow. Um, but also, June Food Pantry, June 27th, um, from 1 to 3. We need our food, the food here um, by a week from Tuesday. We need canned fruit, canned corn, canned potatoes, SpaghettiOs, ravioli, and spaghetti sauce. So, and then any other non-perishable food. Also, Church in the Park will be July 10th at 11 a.m. There will not be any services here that day. Dallas Lauderdale, the former Ohio State basketball player and the son of a minister over around Cleveland area, will be our main speaker. So just wanted to remind everybody of that. Also, if you have any children that you know of from ages 9 to 18 that you think would like to go to camp, um, we have those pamphlets out in the foyer. We just got six new ones in this week. So um, we were starting to get some of those in. So if anybody would like, or if you know of any kids that you think would like to go to church camp, 
grab a pamphlet, grab two, grab as many as you want. If there's not enough out there, um, just let me know and we will be able to drive them down if that's what you're concerned about and be able to pick them up. So um, if you know any kids, um, just do that. Also, Vacation Bible School will be July 25th through the 28th. That's Monday through Thursday. Uh, the Community VBS at Gormley Park from 6 to 8. There's going to be a lot of fun things. I believe we're going to have some blow-up bouncy houses. I know we're going to have some free shirts. We're going to have some free pizza. Um, if you're willing to serve as a volunteer, call Kathy Morris at 273-2378. So, again, love for you to be involved with that. Also, Ohio Council will be August 4th through August 5th. Um, and we need delegates for that, so if that's something that you'd be interested in going to, talk to me and we can make that happen if you're a member. Um, Canada Fishing Trip for men will be August 25th through September 3rd, and if you're interested in that, um, again, talk to me. And then also, um, if there's anything else, just feel free to give me a call and we can kind of go from there. So at this point, we will close with prayer, shut off the internet, and then I have a couple more items to discuss, and then we'll let you guys go about your way. So let's pray. Father, we come to you today once more. Lord, we're thankful again for your word. We're thankful for those that are watching online, and we just thank you for those that continue to tune in, Lord. When it's, it was neat to hear at General Council this week of different things and different people that watch every week. Maybe it's not on Sunday, but it's throughout the, the week that they continue to watch, Lord. So we just pray that souls can be changed by things that's happening through Facebook, that things can be changed because you speak to their hearts. So Lord, I just pray right now that if there's anybody watching and maybe there's some people in the community that would like to try out Heritage, then Lord, we just pray right now that let them know that they would be welcome and give them the strength to be able to step into the church building. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. And if you are watching on Facebook and you are looking for a church home, we have services here every Sunday morning at 1030 and we'd love to have you. See you next week.